Or can we both record? I don't know. I just hit oh. record, but uh, you can try to. I don't know if both of us can record or should it be okay. only one? I don't know. I mean, after all, this um, is a talk on freedom from scarcity. So I, I don't know yeah. <laughs> if there is any, if there is any. Let's see if I can record as well. I think, um, let's see. It should allow you. Yes, I think. Okay, perfect. All right. Do you want to record? Do you want to wait till we get started, or you want to start? It's recording up to you. Now? I don't know how many people you're expecting. No, you're the boss. Um, I'm in your hands. So. Oh. Uh, because. No, you wait, wait, wait! It's the other way around. Pardon me. Uh, I said it's the other way around. Uh, I'm waiting like for four or five more people. Okay, let's wait for another minute or something. In that time, we can have everybody say a few things about themselves and maybe why, uh, what drew you to this talk today. So we can make it interactive right from the start. <laughs> if that seems okay, yeah? Go ahead. I can start. Can go first? Yeah, I'll start. Uh, I'm Jale. And uh, Miss Monique had sent sent this, and I, I read all the things that Monique sends me, but I think this stood out to me. I, I just opened my own practice, uh, so my my own business, and and I think that some some things start to happen when you take a risk like that. And so I think even monetary, right? Um, I think that's the big one for me is not feeling like there's enough, even though there's there seems to always be plenty. <laughs> Um, and so I think this really stood out to me and I have a sense I'm going to get, get something from it. <laughs> um, but that's why I'm here. Wonderful. Um, I'm Jason. I, uh, feel similarly. I think, uh, I've been really thinking about this notion of, of scarcity and ironically digital scarcity, um, as we were joking earlier, um, about the recording. Uh, and so I, I think that, uh, this is a big issue for Westerners, you know, my, like myself, and uh, I really am, I think, kind of struggling with it as an existential concept of, you know, not having enough anything, whether it's money or things or time or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, I really relate to what Jolly said. Wonderful. Um, my name is Amy, and um, yeah, I just saw the email and I felt drawn to it. And I I immediately signed up for it, but then as I thought about why I might want to come um, in my own life, I think I get um, afraid of the of not having opportunity, or um, that when I get to a certain place, I won't have what I need to do what I want. And I always do. I don't know why that um, that thought continues to run. So that's what I wanted to investigate. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. We haven't heard Calliope's voice till now. <laughs> okay, I'm still on mute. I'm so used to mute myself on Zoom, you know, like usually there's a requirement. Yeah. So you don't hear all the different sounds there anyway um i like the question i don't know exactly i i just jumped in it um uh, to to do it but as i was listening to everybody um i feel like uh i need to trust more um trust more the universe that will provide you to want to say or that um my abilities and and together with that as you were uh, different people were saying but having enough all of that and also of being enough i don't know yes. if that fits there <laughs> really um but there's something about that too that i feel i'm struggling with so um I, again i don't know if it fits but <laughs> open <laughs> Having enough, I trust that I, uh, yeah, because it, 
life has shown me over and over again that the, when I trust, then things happen. And moments that I felt, and now it's an insecure time in terms of, you know, all that happened in COVID, how it affected my practice, how it affected, you know, maybe all of us in some ways and fears of the unknown and, but yeah. Yes, beautifully put. Thank you. Monique, shall we start? Yes, I think, you know, I also put out that um, if people couldn't come, they would, could have access to the recording. So maybe some people just are hoping yeah, for the recording. Yeah, could be that too. But I'll monitor uh, yeah. if anybody comes in to, break, to let them in. Yeah, they can, you know, they can join in late. It's okay. Sometimes people uh, are held up for whatever reason. Namaste to everyone. Thank you yeah. for coming. And uh, we will begin with a short prayer because that is what we do uh, in my lineage. And the prayer signifies the fact that we are not in control of many things. As we grow spiritually, we understand first we are not in control of some things. As we grow further, we recognize that we are not in control of many things. As we fully grow to embrace the truth of ourselves, we understand that we are not in control of anything. And so therefore, the prayer is, is an invocation it, it has two purposes. First is what is called, uh, you know, a dig bandhana in, in Sanskrit. Dig bandhana means that there is a healing string that is surrounding all of us. And, and that shows that we are, you know, we are creating this sacred space and uh, where we have this safe, sacred space to be together to enjoy one another and grow. That is the first purpose. The second purpose of the prayer is to invoke the divine, Lord, Goddess, however you, uh, you call out to that higher power and to, to pray for uh, there to be understanding, to pray for all the obstacles to be removed and to pray for clarity in communication and in the reception of that communication. So with these words, I will pray first and then I will explain to you what, uh, what this prayer was about. And then we can, let's see where this talk goes. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunak Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvi Nabadhi Tamas Toma Vidvishavahai Om Shantishantishantihi May the great being protect us both. Why us both? Because there are so many people, it's not just two, but the teaching is always one on one. So in Sanskrit, we have the dual, not just the singular and the plural to facilitate this. So may the teaching uh, protect us both. May the great being nourish us both. And Together, may we accomplish great things. May great things come out of this encounter. And great things doesn't have to have some kind of a monetary value because we have that understanding in our hearts that great things means it has to be very, uh, you know, we have to become rich and famous. That's not the point. You know, sometimes it is about unlocking some uh, block uh, to inner greatness inner contentment 
inner abundance. And it is as Calliope said about discovering that one is enough, not just one has enough. So all that is, you know, all that makes one great. And so may we accomplish great things together and then may our studies and our encounter be brilliant. May the radiance uh, go to disseminate and to whoever is in need of these words. Uh, and then finally, may, may there not be any kind of misunderstanding between one another. Because usually what happens is that, you know, in a teaching situation, there, are, there could be misunderstandings because of projection, because of transference, because of so many, uh, you know, psychological issues. And so may it be not there. And then we always end the prayer with three shantis. And I think everybody knows shanti means peace. Peace is uh, the ability to not be disturbed by the world. But then why is it repeated three times? Because the ancient sages thought it, uh, the, uh, you know, thought it appropriate to, to categorize the sources of disturbance. And then each time you say Shanti, you're praying for that particular source of disturbance to not be there. The first Shanti, uttering the first Shanti removes what we call the disturbance uh, centered on uh, on forces beyond our control, sudden earthquake, God forbid, or some, you know, electrical outage, because now we are on Zoom. And so things like these, uh, over which we have no control, Shanti, Shanti. And then the second source of disturbance could be in our surroundings. Everything is going well, but then something the weather is too hot too cold something is not right uh, and and so that sort of curbs the enjoyment and the engagement and the last shanti is disturbances centered on oneself everything is wonderful but then suddenly one has a doubt am i wasting my time why am i here and that st stops one from from participating so this is the this is how we we pray and and before we get into the talk a few you know just a couple of uh, sentences about what i do and what this is all what this uh, uh, tradition is and I, monique i really loved that you said you know how did you put it you said hidden teacher uh, segment or series. I just loved that. My heart jumped in joy when I read those words because, you know, as you all know, Mo Monique is so intuitive. She's just so wonderful that way. And my heart jumped with joy because in our tradition, all the teachers are supposed to be hidden. <laughs> we are all hidden teachers. <laughs> what is up front and center are the teachings. If the teacher is up front and center, then, you know, then it, it, it borders on a cult because if you're following the person. <laughs> you're not following the, uh, what is being taught. So the teacher in our tradition is like this microphone, <laughs> amplifies the words of our holy uh, teachings, which are called the Vedas. And uh, these Vedas are very, very ancient and uh, it is a oral tradition. It is an oral tradition that is carried mm -hmm. from the head, <laughs> you know, uh, and then from the mouth to the ear. It's called the ear mouth tradition. So from the ear mm -hmm. of the student who then becomes the teacher and from the mouth of that teacher to the ear of another student. So I belong to the ear mouth tradition of hidden teachers because the teachers are, we, we are this is not about me. <laughs> this is about you. This is not about me. This is because, why do I say this is about you? Because the subject matter of these teachings is that I that is misunderstood. The I that is free, that is whole, the self that is free, that is whole, that is always contented, that is free of afflictions, 
is the one that is that is talked about here and the discovery of that self you know takes uh, takes some time not because the teachings are difficult but because we as students are difficult <laughs> we have certain resistance we have certain uh, you know we are eclipsed by certain misunderstandings of the i so the i is known you cannot say i don't know myself of course i know myself you know because the i is self happens to be self evident if i ask the question are you here you don't have to sms the significant other or look at the significant other to give me an answer what do you think am i here no you are here and you know that yes i am nobody can deny that and even if someone were to say i am not here it would be like a small child hiding behind the couch and saying don't look behind the couch i'm not there so you are advertising your presence it's a presence that refuses to shut up it is it is you loud and clear and it is what we call self evident i the self is already self evident so i am is not a problem everybody knows i am i am but please 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 do not ask the next question who are you that's where the problem comes <laughs> how much time do you have i am this many at all i have these many problems i am an idiot nobody loves me i am i have this i have that and these, these are all so the i is the self evident i attracts because it is partially known if it is an unknown i you cannot make a mistake on it and again if it is a known i you cannot make a mistake centered on the i but it is a half known i and we know that half knowledge is always dangerous <laughs> it proves dangerous so the half known i in the vedas we have a beautiful example it is like something lying in your front yard at twilight and it has three bends it is lying in a curve what is it oh what can it be you go out the light is not uh, very bright it's twilight and you say eek snake but then fortunately you have your cell phone which has a flashlight <laughs> which you never knew how to turn on till now and then suddenly you turn it on because necessity is the mother of discovery <laughs> you, you turn it on and then you say oh this is not a snake this is a rope maybe a neighborhood kid was playing or maybe it was something that somebody had used and it is lying with three bends looking like a snake the rope lends itself to this this kind of a superimposition the wrong understanding of this i uh, uh, the it's wrong understanding because the rope is not unseen but yet it is not fully seen just like the i the atma the word for the i is atma just like the atma partially recognized rope becomes a sitting duck for all kinds of fears <laughs> and then in the discovery that it is rope then what happened to what happened to the snake where did the snake go did it slither into the bushes no it slithered back into that same mind which projected it so similarly all the projections of the i are taken away through a unique methodology and uh, you know through 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 the teaching so this is the the lineage that i represent uh, teaching the veda and vedanta and so now we come to this uh, question the, the topic for today freedom from scarcity when i look at the word scarcity what jumps out is the first part of the word scare <laughs> that is what it is and so this is something which is uh, as all of you have uh, talked about uh, very uh, important because there is some way in which there is a constriction in this area and even though from whatever i have heard uh, each of you talk about why you are interested in this you know a lot about this and 
in a way we are preaching to the choir but it's still nice because we can enjoy a nice harmony and uh, of of minds and hearts so it is nice to recall it is nice to reiterate it's nice to be together uh, dwelling on this topic we have a uh, we have a goddess in the tradition and it's a tradition that uh, you know uh, that has a vision to unfold and that vision is you are enough <laughs> you are whole you are free of whatever you seek you are free of that and you you uh, you are one with the cause of the universe that is the vision and in order to uh, understand and assimilate this vision a way of life is uh, recommended that is conducive to to internalizing this vision and that uh, internalization or that uh, that way of life is what we are going to be talking about today and that is the world of prayer surrender god goddess you know various ways in which we invoke that one being through many forms many functions many names and so we have a goddess her name is lakshmi lakshmi means radiance have you heard of the goddess lakshmi anybody has yeah so lakshmi is radiance and lakshmi is extremely famous how famous i'll tell you a small anecdote i was in washington dc in one of the biggest temples and i, I used to teach there and then uh, one time uh, there was a group from a seminary it was just about close to a hundred people and i was talking about the hindu tradition and teaching them and then uh, they requested a temple tour and i said okay come along and and there was this huge temple with various shrines in it so i was explaining each shrine and then I would go to the next one and they would all come and I would wait till they all gathered and then I would start explaining about the next shrine and the whole thing took about an hour and a half because the temple is huge and so we stood stood by goddess Lakshmi and then I said this is Lakshmi she is the goddess of abundance inner and outer and then I started to talk about Lakshmi and I started to talk about how you know every we, we believe that she visits us and this is what we do to facilitate her visit and everything and then I went on to the next shrine and I started to talk about the next shrine but then I found out I was talking to myself because nobody followed me to the next shrine <laughs> Lakshmi had them captivated and these were people from you know these were uh, uh, people you know who belonged to the christian tradition they were very happy there and they were just you know uh, they were not uh, but, but lakshmi basically she just held them in thrall <laughs> and then they they were they were all kneeling in front of her it was so beautiful and so this is lakshmi <laughs> very very lakshmi is the goddess of freedom from she is the presiding goddess of the freedom from scarcity and this you know this internalization of lakshmi is what i'm going to be speaking about for some some of this and then we'll leave some time for some interaction questions thoughts etc from all of you because i'd love to hear and so this Lakshmi, which means radiance and just the beauty of being, she's decked with jewels and everything. And she symbolizes the, that contentment and resources. And in the Puranas, which are the, which are the Vedas made simple in the form of stories so that all the common people can understand. These are the Puranas. And in the Puranic lore, she is, you know, depicted as, as the consort of Vishnu, the one who, uh, the one who maintains the universe. Vishnu is God with the name of the one who sustains this universe. 
So same God, we, we don't have many gods, but the same God with, you know, we, because everything is God, we just delight in, in seeing, you know, in, in naming them and having uh, various, uh, you know, having them for tea, you know, that's what we do. And so, so then Vishnu, so the first thing the Puranas say is that please do not make the mistake of thinking Lakshmi belongs to you. <laughs> she belongs to Vishnu. She doesn't belong to you. And this is the first teaching. So what does this mean? This means that when we lead our lives, thinking that the Lakshmi is resources, Lakshmi is abundance. Lakshmi is of course money, but not limited to money. And Lakshmi is all the resources that we command you know, movable property, immovable property, whatever we have, whatever anybody has given us, whatever we have earned with our own earnings, all this is Lakshmi. Whatever enhances our lives and makes it better is also Lakshmi. So Lakshmi, there are many forms of Lakshmi. So we have Dhana Lakshmi, Lakshmi in the form of money. Dhanya Lakshmi, Lakshmi in the form of food, because of which one can become a foodie, that is Lakshmi, the ability to enjoy, the ability to, to be surrounded by plentifulness. And that is Lakshmi, Dhanya Lakshmi. And the Lakshmi in the form of abundance in a household, Griha Lakshmi. A household is, is supposed to be, you know, in, in the traditional ancient India, household is the, that which is a place for giving. Anybody can come and say, please, can I have a meal? And there should be enough for at least one more person cooked uh, other than yourself. That is, you know, so a place where cooking is practiced, place where giving is practiced, that is what is called, you know, Griha Lakshmi. Santana Lakshmi is Lakshmi expressed in the form of progeny, children that are very dear to us. And so that children is Santana Lakshmi. And the joy derived out of children, that is a resource, definitely. So that is Santana Lakshmi. And then we have uh, the Lakshmi in the form of domestic peace, marital happiness, household abundance, all these things. So these, these are all Lakshmi to understand it. So we, we are not only thinking of bank account, we are thinking of, uh, you know, and then we have Shanta Lakshmi, Lakshmi in the form of inner peace. These are the various and we can keep on adding to it. Lakshmi in the form of health, Lakshmi in the form of peace, Lakshmi in the form of so many things. And where did this Lakshmi come from? That's the second question we ask. Then we have a wonderful story for that. And what is that story? Long, long ago, once upon a time, Devas, the celestial wonderful beings, and the Rakshasas, the Asuras, the baddies, the not very nice people, the, the unethical people, demonic beings. We don't have devil or evil. These are all just devotees gone wrong in the tradition. <laughs> so devotees with a hubris and, uh, you know, devotees with a lot of pride become demonic beings. So there was a, there was a uh, prophecy and in the prophecy, the Devas and the Asuras both heard the prophecy. It said that, you know, you have to churn the ocean. And when you churn the ocean, you will get the secrets of immortality. And so the Devas on one side and the Asuras on one side, in a rare moment, decided to cooperate because the churning of the ocean is not a joke. It's, it's huge. And then, so then the, the Asuras being strong and just brawn, the Devas are brain. And so the two combination is, is needed. And so the Asuras, they, they, what did they do? They just plucked off a mountain, a, a huge mountain of the earth and made it into a churning rod. And then there was a poisonous snake, huge poisonous snake. 
and then they made it into the churning <laughs> rope. So they, you know, and somehow that snake agreed. The name of the snake was Vasuki. And the devas tricked the asuras to holding the side of the snake which had the mouth there, which was always whenever the snake breathed, all poisonous flames would come out and toxic flames. Because the devas said to the asuras, well, 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 you know, this, uh, you should see this. Come on, you know, you should be here. And uh, who, who can hold the mouth of the snake? They said, me, me, me. And all of them went there. And then holding the tail of the snake were the devas. But that was also not easy because the angry and the resentful snake would just lash out its tail. And there also there were some casualties. And so the churning of the ocean began. And then lots of things came out. And Lakshmi came out, you know, and everybody just stopped churning and welcomed her, enthralled. Before the whole pot of what is called the nectar of immortality, which is the teaching that one is enough, which is the teaching that one doesn't need anything other than oneself to be able to be free, whole, limitless, and grow into kindness, compassion, and abundance, grow into living that life. Before that pot of immortality came out, Lakshmi came out as a precursor of this knowledge as some ways to practice being receptive and open to this knowledge, Lakshmi emerged, Goddess Lakshmi emerged. And then, see, this is all a metaphor. The Devas and the Asuras are not part of some fanciful and fascinating tale from the Puranas. The Devas are right here in the, in, in the heart in the antakarana, in the inner instrument, in the heart, what constitutes the heart and mind. Two kinds of forces always at war. The one that is naturally in tandem with the laws of the universe, doesn't want to break anything, just wants to be and just wants to, you know, is, is ethical, is compassionate. Those forces are within us, as are the forces that keep questioning that, that keep wanting to run ahead of ourselves, that keep wanting to broadcast the message that we are, you know, we are idiots. There is, you know, there is FOMO in the universe. What is FOMO? Fear of missing out. Okay, that is teen slang. You know, that is what it is. For more. So there is four more. Oh my God, so many opportunities, so little time. So I can't be in many places at once and all these things. You know, this is basically this feeling of always scarcity, running, 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 don't have enough, don't have enough, don't have enough, which is, of course, as uh, was pointed out earlier, is because of that basic premise I am not enough. I am not enough leads to I don't have enough. And so therefore, this is, you know, this is that inner scarcity that that is, you know, trying to trying to resolve. And then the snake stands for the creative power, the creative power, which brings us out of this morass, this stagnation, this place, this impasse, this place of non action. And then you harness the creative power and the churning of the ocean is the churning of the unconscious mind. It's basically a form of psychotherapy, really. So the churning of the unconscious mind to see what is in the, what is in the way, what is in the way of living this life of, of happiness, contentment, abundance of inviting Lakshmi. Why is not Lakshmi coming? Why is it such a battleground here? And to go with the back to the ocean story, the churning of the ocean story, before Lakshmi comes out, her elder sister comes out. OMG, she must be so much, if Lakshmi is herself so irradiant, her uh, elder sister must be even more so much radiant. Wrong. Really? Why? Because the elder sister is wearing tatters when she comes out. <laughs> she's, 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 she's got a scowl on her face. 
you know, if you look at it in terms of emojis, that's the one with a scowly face, okay, with the lips pointing downwards. And she's the one that has a scowl on the face. She hates the world. She hates herself. She hates the universe. And she was the one who comes out. And she says, hey, I am here. Why does the younger sister get all the shade? Why does she get all the attention? Why am I in the background? It's very clear why she, 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 nobody knows her and why she is not famous because look at her. Doesn't have a kind word to say. She comes and curses everybody and everything. And she comes and, you know, she comes and casts a doom wherever she goes. She carries a personal rain cloud into every house she visits and leaves the rain cloud there hanging and goes away. Some people are like that. And, you know, being around them, you catch a depression, even though you are very happy to begin with. And so this is, you know, what is her name? This is her, the elder sister of Lakshmi and her name is Alakshmi not Lakshmi, <laughs> opposite of Lakshmi, when you, you know, it's like kind and unkind, you know, the, the prefix un makes the kind, the word opposite. So Alakshmi meaning not at all Lakshmi, opposite of Lakshmi. So really, Lakshmi is very much there. This Alakshmi has to be managed in the, the the moral of the story is and driven away <laughs> driven away and so in the rituals in india when we invite lakshmi to the house we tell her straight away you my dear are very welcome we want you but keep your sister at the door don't we she is not welcome <laughs> you are welcome and so there are elaborate ways in which the sister is kept at the door. All the things that attract her, like a broomstick and things that, you know, things that, that uh, exemplify scarcity, etc., are put at the door so that she hangs out at the door, whereas Lakshmi is invited in. Lakshmi is invited in with light. Wherever there is light, Lakshmi presides. And wherever there is, there is darkness, the, the Alakshmi, that is her realm. You know, it's like so many stories we hear in the Western world, like, you know, vampires, etc. They don't like the light. They like all the, the, the darkness. The darkness stands for ignorance. The darkness stands for areas in the heart that are not fully lit up, that are not, that are not alive to the possibilities. Darkness also stands for the ways in which we hide our light due to so many things, starting with, you know, starting with the notions that I am not enough, I have not enough, uh, starting with familial, uh, familial, uh, what is that called, wrong teachings, familial teachings, starting with all kinds of uh, uh, difficulties growing up starting with even the national and the cultural uh, understandings or rather misunderstandings of abundance. Oh, this is only for our country, not for you. And we see this during the pandemic. We will not share our vaccines. It's for us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, um, Ishvara, which is the name for the great being in, in Sanskrit has other ways. Now we have a new variant, you know, Omicron or whatever. And mind you, the first two letters are Om. Yes, so you know where it has come from. It has come from that, that holy presence, Om. And, and then, you know, and then, okay, now there is a different debate. Oh, yes, the whole world should be vaccinated. The WHO was telling this right from the beginning. But so this is, this is the national, you know, mentality of scarcity. So the scarcity goes all the way from the micro, you know, recesses of our own hearts to the, the ways in which, you know, global commerce, global health decisions, everything, you know, uh, you know all those, you know, everything, uh, where everything is concerned. So from the micro to the macro, 
what we see right now dear friends is a lakshmi presiding it's a lakshmi a lakshmi a lakshmi all the way and the pandemic really is an important you know i really feel that is this has this is an opportunity to change the world around that's why i don't call it the corona virus i call it the karuna virus karuna means compassion the virus that is helping us to discover the inner lakshmi that that is the only antidote to this uh, to this uh, stagnation to this pandemic is we that have to each one turn the ocean <laughs> So yeah, exactly. We have to turn the ocean. Yeah, you have to turn the ocean. Yeah, you have to turn it around and turn it around. That is exactly. You are absolutely correct. And so this is the this is the antidote. Is is that there is there has to be change. And Mahatma Gandhi said, "Don't wait for the change to come. It'll never come. Be the change that you would like to see, and then it will come." because you know it's like uh, otherwise you're depending on so many forces and so many things to execute this change and that change will never happen and so therefore what so therefore we are at a very interesting crossroads so we have to, so alakshmi presides and alakshmi presides in ill ventilated and ill lit spaces within the the unconscious mind and so the need for the hour is to ventilate those spaces and to spend some time dialoguing with a lakshmi that a lakshmi is here she is a force she is a force to be reckoned with and in fact if you say shu shu she will not go away because she's been there <laughs> she's and she'll continue to be there it's not about shu shu anymore it is about understanding dialoguing with her and understanding why she is there and then you find that she's no longer a scary presence she is there because there you know she is a coping mechanism that is how the childhood was the childhood was like this the culture was like this the the, the nation state was like this in where one grew up the parentage was like this and then because of all this a lakshmi decided to protect this baby you and and give you a hug she was being motherly in her own dysfunctional way because that's all she knew how to do this a lakshmi is an inner child that decided to become the gatekeeper of everything life sustaining because as somebody else again pointed out the question of trust is no trust and that distrust is a lakshmi that which signifies the distrust and the need to protect oneself from it that is who a lakshmi is and this you know this is why the need to interrogate and look at a lakshmi so when you take a deep look at a lakshmi what do you find you find a scared being as i said scare is the first part of scarcity that scare that inner scare fear of making mistakes fear of not being loved fear of being abandoned fear of being neglected fear of not being attended to no matter how hard one shouts how much one cries fear that one will be not listened to fear that one really doesn't matter this is all a lakshmi these were the coping mechanisms to shut down that distrust to have calluses uh, on our hearts as one grows up this is part of everybody's life everybody's life starts with being comforted within quotes i put by a lakshmi being in the lap of a lakshmi really a dysfunctional mother but a very protective mother in her own way because she did all that she needed to do and what is this a lakshmi it is your own self that is split into two 
the distrustful caretaker because nobody else is there to give that care which one is needing. Everybody has had some omissions and commissions in childhood. And so one has, you know, one becomes a ninja. One becomes a ninja, defensive, offensive. This is what it is. And so how do we, how do we love up this Alakshmi? How do we integrate her within it? And there, you know, is a beautiful metaphor. We have a, we have an icon in the Hindu tradition and it is called Lord Dakshina Murti. Dakshina Murti is half feminine and half masculine and is, 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 is the invocation of the Lord and the Goddess in the form of the ancient and the first teacher of this knowledge. Then it's a very, very pleasing uh, image of this Lord and the Goddess together, very pleasing image and has the Veda book in the hand, has the fire of knowledge in the hand, all these things. And then at the foot, there is a small baby. At least that's what it looks like from a distance. A small baby is there. And then you think, why is this being, why is the great being stepping on this baby, this helpless baby? Then you go closer. Uh-oh, it's not a baby at all. <laughs> It is a dwarf-like creature, fully grown, truncated, has a big moustache and has a terrible scowl and in one hand a dagger it is holding and in the other hand a sword, offensive and defensive simultaneously. And the foot of this great being, Dakshina Murthy, is on this on this small little demon demonesque figure demonic figure what does this mean it's as though lord dakshina murti is saying heal pun intended h e e l and h e a l both at the same time very very nice this is this is you know this is that's why we say vedanta what i teach is super therapy because you know this is something which is very beautiful this shows that there is the adult who is wanting the teachings who is wanting to to embrace the truth of oneself who is wanting to initiate the spiritual growth to be a a person who is compassionate who is kind who is free of all kinds of afflictions but then there is this inner being and what is the name of this inner being it's called apasmara it literally means the one who haunts through bad memories this is what is the uh, another symbol of alakshmi an iconographic symbol here of alakshmi and the this you know this being is is at surrendered to the lord to the goddess you know, the unconscious cannot be gotten rid of. It is integrated. It is made to be something that is there, but it does not cast a pall on you. It is there. Let it be there. But it does not anyhow overpower you. It does not anyhow, uh, you know, come in the way of who you are. That is basically the journey. And that journey of, of neutralizing Alakshmi, that is a lifelong journey, comes first through learning the meaning of the word surrender. How does one surrender? Surrender comes from the understanding that one doesn't call any of the shots in one's life. Surrender comes from the understanding that I can't fix everything. Getting rid of Alakshmi is not DIY. It's not a do-it-yourself task. I need help from every source, from many sources. And this understanding that one needs help is an, is an expression of one's wisdom and intelligence, not of one's weakness as one is, you know, as one mistakenly thinks. That one needs help is a, are words of wisdom, is an understanding that is very, very deep. 
And then, of course, there is worldly help available. There is all kinds of uh, things that one can, you know, help oneself. And then finally, you know, the, it is also important to get the help, the absolute help in the form of seeking help from, from the goddess, from the Lord in whichever, however, uh, you know, from this being that is the manifest as this universe. We don't say that God created this world. Yes, God created, we can say, but really more importantly, that which is manifest in this whole universe is non-separate from that who is the maker. This is the vision. So for us, we don't have, you know, we don't refer to the rivers, the mountains, the oceans, etc., as resources. That's a very mercenary way of looking at it. For us, these are our mothers, Mother Ganga, Mother Yamuna, the rivers are our mothers, the mountains are our brothers, the trees are our, you know, are our friends. The sky is the father, the earth is another big, very patient mother, big mother. And so this is how we live amongst already a manifest, you know, entities that are alive, that are alive to our needs that propitiate us, that take care of us. And so the whole life is an exchange. It is a reciprocity. You take care of me. You give me food. You give me sunlight. You give me air. You give me water. And in my own interest, I will also take care of you. And we further this more and more. We further this. And that is how Alakshmi, you know, Alakshmi, the hold of Alakshmi becomes less and less. The more the areas of our inner, uh, you know, instrument, the mind, heart, etc., the more the areas of this uh, inner instrument are lit up with the understanding that we have participated in, in something that we need not have. We have participated, all of us, in a kind of a scarcity from ranging from the individual to the global, for which there is no need, for which there is no space anymore. And which for which now, especially at this crossroads of this pandemic and so many other, you know, of its offshoots, the, the need for the moment is to get rid of this Alakshmi, to get rid of the hold of Alakshmi. To understand this, we have to see that the coping mechanism has lost its hold and at best it is just a moping mechanism. That is what it is. The coping mechanism has become a moping mechanism where you are just rehearsing the old wounds. You are not reversing the old wounds. And so that's why in the ritualistic invocation of Lakshmi, and then you say, tell her, please leave your sister at the door. That gives us some clues. A Lakshmi cannot be coddled. Oh, you poor thing, you had a bad life. Well, th that makes her stronger. <laughs> that is participating even more in the ignorance. At some point in time, when you embrace uh, Lakshmi, that radiance, that inner radiance, that light, which is found through the commitment for self-growth. See, we talk about two kinds of growth, the physical and the, you know, spiritual. Physical growth, you don't have to have a commitment to. You neither need prayer nor a striving. Nobody, you know, says, oh, when will I get my first wrinkle? When will I get my first gray hair? Don't worry, it will come. <laughs> it comes on its own. <laughs> it is already there. Nobody, you, nobody wonders like this. So this growth, growth happens on its own from birth to death. But the other kind of growth, which is specific to the human being, because one has free will, one, which is a gift to, for this growth. This spiritual growth happens on one's initiative. One's, you know, one has to participate in that growth. 
When will I become compassionate? If you keep wondering, that will never happen. Compassion has to be encouraged through acts of compassion. That's how one becomes compassionate. Becomes within apostrophes because one is already compassionate and it has got layers of Alakshmi. And the layers of Alakshmi come out when you rehearse the compassion, which is Lakshmi. When you give, even when you cannot give, when you give. This is when, you know, Alakshmi recedes because even she is happy because her purpose is fulfilled in a way. She can go to somebody else where, she, where there is still a purpose left. She doesn't have to be in the recesses of your heart in, and, she, and the old wounds can finally, you know, resolve. They don't need to be rehearsed, they can be reversed. So therefore, this, you know, so what does it mean? I will, I will close this, you know, uh, with some uh, practical tips of leading one's life in the everyday to effect this transformation. And this is again from the teachings of, of the Vedas. We find in the West that we live our lives, we have started to live our lives through violent metaphors. Let me illustrate. Everybody says, you know, you, you call them in the morning and people, I, if, when I call somebody in the morning, they say, I just jumped out of bed. The question is, why, why you know, coming from India, I don't, I'm still new to these expressions. Jump, why do you have to jump out of bed? Why can't you walk out of bed? I threw off the covers. I jumped out of bed. Then what did you do? I jumped into the shower. Why do you have to jump into the shower? Never understood this. And then worse, I grabbed a bite to eat. OMG, this is getting really, you know, terrible. And then what? I hit the road. Even there is one song, hit the road, Jack. Don't come back, no more, no more. Some old song is there, like this. I hit the road because I had to get to the work, get to work. And then what, what did you do there? I cranked out some emails and some numbers. I crunched some numbers, cranked out some emails. Then what happened? I became cranky, naturally. What else will happen? And then what? On the way to work, I hit the road. And then on the way back, I beat the traffic. Again, all these violent metaphors. I beat the traffic. Then what did you do? Nobody cooks. I came home. And then what? I threw something together. And then if you're a teenager, you'll say, I nuked something. The terrible, that nuked means atom bomb. Okay, this is what my, my mind is, is, is very alarmed by, by this time. And then what did you do after that? I crashed, <laughs> you know. And then you say, oh, I, I don't have my life. Then people say, my life lacks meaning. I don't have any connection to what I do. How will you have connection? How will you have connection if this is how you lead your life every day? From, from, from today, this has to stop. This is all just inviting, not only inviting a Lakshmi, but giving her a throne, a, a, a scepter, and then a, a wand to, to rule your heart. She will enslave you at this, at, at this rate. So for us in the Hindu tradition, the day begins by just looking at our hands when we say a prayer. May Lakshmi reside on my fingertips. May whatever I do be abundant and productive. May Saraswati, the goddess of knowledge, back my actions. And then when the feet touch the ground, you don't jump out of bed. You, you, you put the feet on the side of the bed and touch the ground and say, Mother Earth, I walk all over your grace every day. At least today, let me not be a burden. It's a two second prayer, just an intention. You don't jump into the fire, into the shower. What do you do? The shower is Mother Ganga. May all the holy rivers enter this bucket of water or this shower or where, wherever the water is coming from. May this rejuvenate me. 
May this cleanse me, not only of the dirt that has accumulated over the course of the day, but also, uh, you know, the inner dirt in the form of unkindness, retaliation, jealousy, fear, anger. May this be cleansing, O oh, mothers, in the form of the water. No one should grab a bite to eat because that also is a prayer. There is an inner fire ceremony happening that hunger is Vaishwanara, the inner fire, and the food that I eat is an offering to the inner fire. That's why, you know, you are told, don't talk when you eat. And when I first came to America, I was confused because they said they would tell me, let's go for lunch and talk it over. And I was very confused because my mother always told me and my grandmother told me, everybody told me, don't talk when you eat. It's rude. And here they would say, let's go out for lunch and talk. So the first two times, whoever took me to lunch was very disappointed because I didn't say a word because I was eating in silence. And because this is important, because this is an act of prayer. It's not that you don't talk at all, you just talk what is needed. That is how it is. And hitting the road is not advised because it is unsafe. And so, you know, the car is, 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 is taking you from one place to another. It is, it is your chariot. You worshipfully enter it. You, you pray before you drive and prayerfully drive and get to the destination. And work becomes meaningful when you connect to it, not just because you're getting a paycheck, but because even unbeknownst to you, you are making a difference. Milton said at the end of Paradise Lost, they also serve who only stand and wait. And this is, you know, this is important. Everything is service. Your life is not an accident. Your life is not purposeless. You have been crafted and made for some purpose or a series of purposes, which you may not even know but which is important to participate, which you may spend lifetimes to discover what is my purpose and that's okay. But even while you are wondering what is your purpose, you are actually fulfilling it, believe it or not. And then when you come home, the cooking is itself a prayer because you're, you know, you're engaged in the sacred art of transforming ingredients into something delicious, tasty, life affirming. Eating is another prayer. Going to sleep is another prayer. Where you say, this whole day has come and, you know, come and gone. And I don't know what I have done and what I have not. May the next one be more, you know, may, may I learn to be more compassionate, less reactive, less, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, better at uh, managing my anger, better at managing a Lakshmi within. This is how we lead the day. This is how the advice is. But unfortunately, in the rat race of the everyday, this is forgotten. These ancient, this ancient knowledge is not just, it, it may be coming from what we call India or the Vedas, but it is there. It is there in all of humanity. If we spend some time to slow down, if we spend some time to connect with others and with ourselves. So what, what is the takeaway? No more for more. That is the takeaway. No more fear of missing out. No more scarcity because it is all within. And that scarcity comes from a sense of insecurity. I don't have enough. Do you have enough? You try and see. My teacher always used to tell me, you give until it hurts. You practice giving until it hurts to, to say goodbye to a Lakshmi. If, you, if it doesn't hurt, you haven't given enough. That is what he used to say. Because when it hurts, the, the insecurity comes out. Oh no, how will I manage? And you find that you have managed fine. Two, almost two years ago, when the first case of Corona came you know, to, to the West, everybody said, oh no, how will we manage? The economy will be bad. Everything will go down. But we are managing supply chain problems, this problem, that way. We are still eating. We are still alive. Yes, we may not have whatever exactly we want, but we certainly have what we need, plus much more. 
when we look at the universe from this from these eyes from the eyes of lakshmi there is nothing ever lacking either within or without thank you om tat sat you have listened so well i'm just so happy to have been uh, to have shared a little bit of whatever i have been taught and i can i invite you to talk about it comment have if you have any questions i'm happy to save the rest of the time for that may i <laughs> uh i was thinking about a lot of different things and my face hurts from smiling so much so thank you <laughs> uh i was thinking about children and I think why I was thinking about children is I think that they do this, the neutralizing and keeping her at the door much easier yes. than we do. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that. Just yes. the difference. Yes, children naturally uh, embody that, that curiosity, that spontaneity, and that willingness to engage uh, with the universe and see it anew. In fact, the Brahma Sutras, which are taught at the end of the course of study, uh, very, you know, highly evolved text that says that the person of enlightenment, the person of self-knowledge, the one who is no longer in the grip of Alakshmi, basically is childlike, not childish, mind you, childlike, smiling, spontaneous, and without a care in the world, without a care. And that is that is possible to grow into. That is that is definitely possible. Yeah. Other thoughts, questions? I was noticing um, some similarities just from my own experience with. Uh, um, things I've read about non-dualism and non-dualistic thinking. And I'm curious uh, if you, how you would respond to just the framing, a lot of what you said about Lakshmi and Lakshmi in this context of um, seeking outside yourself because uh, it is a false question because you are the entire world and the entire universe so that you, I'm curious if that is similar or related in any way uh, or what your response would be to that kind of approach. Absolutely. That this is what I teach is the non-dualistic philosophy of being. So it's even though we present it for easy assimilation, that is what Vedanta is, non-dualism. And so uh, even though we present it as two forces, Lakshmi and Alakshmi, one of them is less real than the other. This is what we have to understand. There are not really two, there is only Lakshmi. Alakshmi is, is, is an imposter, so to speak, because uh, she arises from the, uh, from the shadow self of, uh, of, of non-understanding. She arises from that. And then when, when there is self-knowledge, that Alakshmi is, is no longer, one is not in the grip of that Alakshmi. So that is basically what it is. So, you you know, everything that you see is an extension of you. So first we say Mother Ganga and, you know, we say Mother River, etc. The rivers are our sisters, our mothers, and mountains are our brothers, fathers, everything. But then later on, every you know, we, we grow to a place where everything is an extension of yourself. Everything is you. And it's not the you that we are normally used to defining. The you as in, you know, somebody with a body, mind, sense, complex, or an individuality. It's the you in the form of that consciousness, which knows it is. The one who answered yes to the question, are you here? That awareness, that consciousness, which touches the whole universe, which gives sustenance and existence to the whole universe, which is sentient and which is unbound, limitless. That is what we call Satchidananda. That Satchidananda you is the entire universe. Monique, some thoughts from you, my dear, please.
I really don't have anything to add except that um, I'm so grateful for this talk. You always make things so clear and relevant. And I love your sense of humor. Um, so it's, it's sifting in, you know, um, and I will take it with me through the next days. So thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, and it's all just Guru's grace. That's, that's all I can say. What we say is what we have been given. Remember, he didn't teach us. That's what it's about. <laughs> uh, you're going to keep calling me on that. Yeah, I love it. I just absolutely loved it. Yes, it's just so appropriate. Um, so, um, I didn't make this up. It, my teacher yeah. used to say, always look for the hidden teachers. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so, I have really sought out people who are like you, you know? Very, very, very wise. Extremely wise. Yeah. Amy, Calliope, any thoughts you would like to share? Any questions? Um, I, I just want to thank you. It was very rich. That's what the, the word that came to me. Like, it was so rich. I, and I, I feel like I... Again, you know, the, the recording. Actually, thank you for recording it. Um, yeah, I think I here, but I feel like you also have, you know, so much there, and I, I want to. Um, yeah, I just want to absorb it, and yeah, thank you. Beautiful. You're welcome. Um, I just had a question on the half masculine, half feminine image you spoke about. I wanted to look into that. What was the name again? Uh, I should probably write it in the chat board. We have okay. two iterations because it will be difficult to spell. So, okay. uh, so you look up these two. Ardhanarishwara. And you look up Dakshinamurti. Put it in the chat board. You can, you can look at that. Well, hello there. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> and thank you for this talk. You're very, very welcome. In closing, is it is it a good time to close, Monique? Or do you have some other things you want to add? No? I have nothing to add. So we can close with a words of blessing. And I will explain it first and then I'll chant it. And so this is how it goes. May... Uh, May everyone be happy and may the world be uh, at peace and may the people who follow dharma, the righteous ways, be nicely protected. May cows and other animals that are unable to take care of themselves also be loved and protected. May it rain just the right amount on time and uh, May the earth be always green. May Mother Earth be green. And may the lands be free from drought and all other difficulties. May all the lands be free from drought. May all beings be happy. May we cultivate the ability to look at only the wonderful things in others. May we see only the auspicious in others, the best in others. And may we uh, grow to be compassionate and non-violent and may, we, uh, may no one be subject to illness or sorrow. 
ಓಂ ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿ ಪ್ರಜಾಭ್ಯ ಪರಿಪಾಲಯಂತ ನ್ಯಾಯನ ಮಾರ್ಗೇಣ ಮಹಿಂ ಮಹೇಶ ಗೋ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣೇಭ್ಯ ಶುಭಮಸ್ತು ನಿತ್ಯಂ ಲೋಕಸಮಸ್ತ ಸುಖಿನೋಂತು ಕಾಲೆ ವರ್ಷತು ಪರ್ಜನ್ಯ ಪೃಥಿವೀ ಸಶಾಲಿ ದೇಶೋ ಯಂಕ್ಷೋ ಭರಹಿತ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ ಸಂತು ನಿರ್ಭಯ ಸರ್ವೇಂತು ಸುಖಿನ ಸರ್ವೇ ಸಂತು ನಿರಾಮಯ ಸರ್ವೇ ಭದ್ರಾ ಪಶ್ಯಂತು ಮಾ ಕಶ್ಚಿತ್ ದುಃಖ ಭಾಗ್ ಭೇತ್ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಮೇ ದರ್ ಬಿ ನೋ ಮೋರ್ ಅಲಕ್ಷ್ಮಿ ಫಾರ್ ಆಲ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಐ ಆಸ್ಕ್ ಸಮ್ ಸಾರಿ ಎಸ್ ಗೋ ಹೆ no um do you teach regularly like the vedanta or the yes i teach regularly where uh where is it uh, let me start off uh, you know with the i have a youtube channel you're welcome to look at that and i'm writing the address <laughs> that is the youtube uh, address and then you can look at the website for the for more information if you would like that will have the it's it's both of them are in the chat board so that will have the list of classes and where you know the the zoom link where i teach uh, so everything is free you can freely come in go out uh, learn listen as you wish Well, thank you for being with us and your radiance. Thank you. Thank you for your brightness and radiance. Thank you for all of you. Thank you for inviting me and good night and good night. For you it's morning, right? Yeah, for me. Good morning. Morning. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All the best. Take care. It was lovely Bye. to meet all of you. Bye. Bye.